good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining from around the world. I see some of you are up very early. Um, or rather you than me, I'm not an early morning person myself. Uh, bear with me while I just share my screen. Uh, so, um, so a quick introduction um, to myself. Um, I, I think I've met some of you before. I think I've done a couple of these sessions over my career. Um, I've been in this industry uh, quite a long time in the storage and data protection industry, um, working at companies like EMC, Violin Memory, uh, to name but, but a couple. And, uh, you know, I've been with ArcServe now for just over three years. So it's an exciting time in the market. I'm going to share with you what we see and what our customers and our partners um, are, are, are sharing with us and what's influencing, you know, what we do and, and why we do it. Um, please interact, uh, stop me, take me down any direction you like. Um, um, I know that most of you will, so I look forward to that. Um, and Paul, why don't you just do a quick introduction of yourself before we carry on? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mick, and uh, great to be here. Uh, my name is Paul Brunier, uh, Technical Director uh, for ArcServe. I've been at ArcServe about two years. Um, my background has been in um, data center, infrastructure, cloud, hyperconvergence, and now I'm in the data protection area, which is uh, um, particularly interesting in terms of where the industry is going right now. I'll be following on uh, Mick's discussion and talk a little bit about uh, some of the technology we have and how that is uh, underpinning some of the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, and then, uh, yeah, from, from, from that point, I'll be happy to answer questions as best I can. And then I'll hand over to my colleague, Amanda, who will be uh, showing you a little bit of the, uh, of the software solutions that we have. Amanda, could you perhaps introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Paul. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Bertucci. I've been at ArcServe well, this uh, last uh, period for about uh, seven years. Um, I am Brazilian. Um, I worked for many years in Latin America, all over Latin America, and I relocated to Barcelona, Spain, where I am right now, um, two years ago. And uh, I've, I've been managing the, the EMEA Bristol team since then. Uh, I've been in the industry for uh, 20 years. Uh, about two, two weeks ago, it was my 20th anniversary. And uh, always working with data protection, with backup, and with uh, ArcServe. So glad to be here, and uh, nice to meet you all. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Amanda. So you can clearly see that they're the they're the brains behind this session. Uh, we'll be answering all the difficult questions. Um, so um, I just want to give everybody a bit of a refresher about ArcServe because I don't think we've briefed a lot of you recently, um, and we have been around a while, and and you know there are. Um, uh, you know, some, some uh, different opinions about who we are and what we do. So, you know, I, I like to think of it, I mean, I like to talk about anything that talks about wine <laughs> or fine food. Um, but, you know, if you think about a nice, a nice German Riesling, sweet Riesling, it's one of the few wines that ages. And those wines can age up to 100 years. And, and we're a bit the same. We've been around for 30 plus years. Um, and in my humble opinion, you know, I did a lot of due diligence before joining Art, so we've, we've actually uh, done a fairly good job at keeping pace and in fact getting ahead of the market in most instances with our innovation, um, uh, either through innovating with technologies or acquisitions. I'm going to talk about that in a few moments just to give everybody a quick refresh uh, as a starting point. Um, we do have a lot of customers, you know, we've got currently over 65,000 active customers. <coughs> I do say active because these are the customers that are currently, um, you know, paying for their paying for their privilege to use our software, um, and we've got you know nearly nearly twenty one thousand of those across EMEA. Um, and when I talk about EMEA, we really do have a presence in pretty much every country <laughs> over EMEA, uh, not just the three primary geographies. So I've said at the bottom there, our roots um, run deep in innovation. Um, Please don't be frightened of this slide. I'm not going to talk to every bullet point, but I just did want to share a couple of points um, to show that um, you know how we've innovated over the years. So those, most of you will know that we were Cheyenne Software back in the day, um, and that Cheyenne got acquired, I think, in 1996 by CA, uh, at which point they were the number one uh, in their marketplace in the world. They just overtaken Legato. Um, you know, in 2014. Um, ArcServe was formed, it was a breakout from CA, but more importantly at the same time, um, we innovated 
Oxford innovated with UDP, and we believe it was the first to market for a unific unification solution uh, for, for backup data protection. Um, why is that important? Well, you know, that's really seven years old. And seven years old is not old for a technology in today's market, as you will all know. So, you know, a lot of vendors will come out saying, I have the new shiny toy, look at this, um, which are, you know, most mostly also over seven years old. Um, so, you know, it's it's great innovation. At the same time, we, we incorporated the Exosoft, uh, Exosoft acquisition, um, which is uh, RHA, you know, now um, relaunched as continuous data protection and continuous availability. Um, but you can see over the years, we've innovated uh, by moving to cloud before cloud was really being adopted um, for cloud hybrid. So allowed customers to move from on-prem to cloud. We bought appliances out back in 2015 um, because that's, you know, the market's moved very rapidly towards adoption of converged infrastructure. And we've, we've enhanced those uh, innovations over the years and also added to that through further acquisitions, for example, Zeta, in 2018, which gives us our Cloud Direct solution. So you don't need any on-prem software. You can just put an agent on the servers and, and, and uh, copy your data to the cloud, uh, offering DRAS and backup as a service. Um, and then last year, um, in 2019, there was some, some really major step forwards. And one of the ones, um, two of the ones that are really exciting for me, not only just the addition of our third generation appliances, but also um, ransomware. And ransomware is gonna be a theme throughout this session from Oxford today, because it's the, it's the number one requirement for our customers and it's the number one headache they have today. Um, and there's a lot of noise, which I want to sort of try and break through and show you what we're doing um, and why we believe it's an appropriate solution. But also our alliance with Nutanix, um, alliance with Sophos, um, were two major step forwards because, as you know, uh, the market's going down, hyper-converged, converged infrastructure, et cetera. But we also then realized because of the huge data growth in the marketplace, um, you all know those statistics better than I do, um, there was a need for more scale up from a data protection. So we imp we've in introduced uh, in 2020 the X series, uh, which gives us that scale up. Paul's going to talk a bit about that. We've taken ransomware protection to the next level, offering our integration with Softbox and the Alliance uh, to the cloud, and uh, just recently announcing universal subscription licensing, bringing that same Softbox integration to the software. So that's really important for us that we now have that level of integration protection across software, appliance, and cloud. So uh, Paul's going to talk a bit more about a bit more about this because you know. Um, one of the things we have to work through uh, is that understanding with our clients um, and the other technology partners in the marketplace, because as I'm going to come on to in a minute, the, the lines are getting very blurred that we see between data protection, cybersecurity protection, um, and understanding the psyche and how these criminals work um, is becoming an absolutely essential uh, thing to do. So apologies for all the logos. It's a compulsory slide. Um, so you know, I just wanted to let you know those 80,000 customers, we have quite a lot of customers around the globe. Um, what I will say uh, is um, things have changed. Um, I'm not going to insult everybody with what's happening in the world with the pandemic, but things have changed quite a lot with the way customers buy uh, technology, their focus areas, their priorities. Um, but what we have seen is some sectors like retail have clearly dropped off, um, but we've seen a strengthening in sectors like uh, local government healthcare, education, uh, and in many areas, retail, uh, sorry, um, manufacturing as well. Um, so a couple of ones off there, McDonald's, that's in Saudi Arabia, just to show the breadth of where our customers reside. Um, Picanel in Belgium, I'm gonna talk about Picanel in a few minutes because that's one of our customers that was hit um, by ransomware. Um, and I want to, we want to walk through uh, that particular incident in that case. You know, uh, Ecoface is a good example of a customer in Germany that, you know, it's a bit like the, the, the founding company is a, a bit like an Experian um, credit broker. And, you know, Ecoface is the service provider to that, uh, th that suite of companies. And that's important because when Amanda does her demonstration, a lot of the services that they provide back around data protection as a service and around um, 
automation of recovery and things like that uh, is using our tech. They use that and they charge that back as a, an internal SLA with chargeback. So it's a, you just want to give you a couple of examples of where we're seeing the market grow, you know, the likes of NHS um, and how they're using our technology. The other um, example for, from a market point of view, there's a, there's a few areas that I'm seeing uh, and Oxerv in general are seeing of, of innovation and growth. You know, we all know that the cloud, um, everyone's moving to the cloud and depending on which report you read, and most are sort of converging on 70, you know, 75% of all data will be in the cloud by 2025. Um, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I'm seeing that on a daily basis, that clouds are becoming the mandated part of, of most um, opportunities that we work. Uh, Hyper-converged, you know, the likes of Nutanix, um, you know, driving, forging that market um, is growing like, like crazy. And it's also fueling converged infrastructures for things like data protection um, as a sort of secondary market. So not just being a hyper-converged, but a converged in this, um, implementation. And we're seeing that um, with our appliance business. So our appliance business has gone from, you know, around eight to 10% three years ago to, you know, north of 50% today. Um, and that's just the simplicity of a turnkey solution um, as a wrapper for our software. Um, and again, I've got another slide on this, but the, the, the convergence of security and data protection um, is moving ahead rapidly. Um, one of the reasons we chose to, to OEM um, an and alliance with Sophos, and we believe Sophos is the most, um, is the strongest player in that marketplace because of their sort of um, deep learning uh, AI algorithms that they use to sort of um, predictively anticipate, not just detect uh, malware. Um, and the cloud, you know, um, the cloud's many things to many people. Um, what we're seeing is uh, some people have been forced to the cloud. Office 365 is a classic example. Um, you know, not everybody wanted to have all of their office in the cloud, but now you have no choice if you use that technology. Um, but the, not everybody wants to back it up to the cloud. In fact, not everybody wants to back it up. This, this, uh, that was a, another thing that we saw. There was a, there was a lag in the understanding that that data is not protected. So we're seeing quite a growth in, in hybrid cloud where people still want on-prem for immediacy of service levels, um, but they, they, they want to take an air gap copy in the cloud um, and certainly in the larger companies. But then there's this as a service. Uh, Nick, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we're getting quite a few questions through the chat. Okay. The first one, which goes back a few minutes ago is from Enrico Signoretti of Gigaum. Enrico is asking, what is the average size of the customer and new deals? So from a revenue point of view or from a config point of view. So I, I, I don't want to disclose too many revenue details, um, but the average deal size for us has probably gone up um, 10x in the last three years because we've moved up market. Um, you know, our history, our long history is SMB. We're now mid markets and small enterprise. Uh, we don't profess to be a large enterprise player um, with the, like, the likes of Veritas, et cetera. Um, uh, from a config point of view, where they used to be sub terabyte, two terabyte type deals, we're now into the multiple hundreds. Uh, and in fact, um, we're just, you know, we've got several customers now, even this quarter with net new business closing uh, petabyte plus deals. So, you know, it's really moved up into the hundreds of terabytes, uh, becoming very much the norm. Um, and I've got, I'm going to come on to why that is. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Enrico, if that does not completely answer your question, please let us know. Um, another question from, this is from David Norfolk at yeah. Analyst House Bloor. Ransomware, how can we kill the ransomware business opportunity and don't say everyone buys ArcServe. <laughs> How can we kill the ransomware business opportunities? I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. You mean stop? How can we kill it? David, would you like to jump in and elaborate the okay. question? Well, it seems to me that ransomware is a great business opportunity because it is um, very profitable and there's zero risk of being caught. And if all of us could just switch off our consciences for a bit, 
we'd all be in the ransomware business. It's just a great business opportunity. So mm. one of the things we've got to do is to make ransomware less of a low risk business opportunity for the people perpetrating it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I agree. And there's many companies that are, I mean, you're not going to stop them. I mean, it's getting worse and the pandemic uh, and the tools I've got to sign the moment talking about some of the tools that they use it. I mean, it's not even, it's not even the people that write the code anymore that do the ransomware. Uh, they provide a service where, where, where less intelligent criminals can actually enact ransomware. Uh, using their code as a service. So, you know, th there's a couple of approaches. You've got the first line of defense, which is to try and stop them getting in in the first place. Um, and, you know, uh, that's that's always going to be challenging because they can tend to, to stay one step ahead. And these, these criminals, Paul's going to talk about it in more detail, but they can take months as they work through the system. And then you've got the last line of defense, which is the part we play in, um, uh, where you've got to assume that someday someone's going to get in and they're going to get into your system and they're going to they're going to enact a, you know a cyber attack which may or may not include um encryption etc and what we believe is we have to hope for the best and plan for the worst um and we believe our architecture and our approach and our partnership with sophos and the way that's implemented actually guarantees a company's ability to recover and I've got some data on that later in the session to actually show that and prove it, and, and also that we'll stand by that. I, I'd agree with that. If you, if if it is not putting people out of business and people are not paying, eventually the business opportunity will disappear. I also wonder though whether there's a place for proactive police investigation to actually locate these people, honey traps for them. Um, international agreements to try and put them out of business because it does seem to me to be a risk-free crime. It, it, it is and, and let's face it most of this is initiated outside of the EU outside of our control per se yeah. um, it, you know so that's always going to be very difficult I think I, I personally believe and I, I've gone on record with this that uh, legislation um, around the EU and the UK and other countries around mandating an insurance-based service, um, mandating that companies take insurance um, will help because those insurers will mandate before they get their, their quotes and, and their terms that they take certain precautions. Um, and I think the technology is advancing for the detection. You've got companies like Vectra, um, you know, that, that can actually track and trace the criminals as they're moving through your network. Um, and that is pretty cool. I think insurance-based makes sense. Um... I'd like to say that one should never pay, but um, I guess that's easy to say if you're not a victim. Well, uh, yeah, some 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 people are, are, are touting that that you know there should be uh, legislation to prevent you from paying. Um, but but that, that, there has to be some kind of insurance behind that, I, otherwise you go out of business. I, I don't think that that's the right thing to do personally. Uh, we also don't think that's the right thing to do. It's become more of a totalitarian police sort of state. I think. You know, moving if if you, if the insurance, for example, um, cyber cyber insurance, they will because they don't want to pay out any money. They will drive the right level of you know you must do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, and, and and I want to share something with you later that we're going to do to the market. It's, it's a bit of a hot off the press for for everyone today. Um, but but vendors like ourselves uh, and the first line of defence vendors like Sophos and and Vector and other, they've got to put skin in the game. They've got to be part of the part of the fix here, and not just not just say, "Hey, it's not our fault. A criminal came in." So I want to share that with you as well. Yeah. The, the, the problem with having mandated insurance, though, is that one, the insurance companies won't want to take part of it because they don't know the risks either yet, um, and two, mandated insurance almost inevitably requires to have government backing behind it because otherwise, you know, the insurers not knowing the risks, um, not knowing anything about all of the customers, uh, as well as knowing very little about the potential threats, simply cannot provide mandatory insurance for everybody. It's um, economically never going to work. I, I, I don't disagree, Tony. I think this is a massive problem, right? And it's going to take much smarter people than me to fix it. But I do know that if you put the problem in the hands of an industry, um, I mean, you know, and, and sort of have some legislation supporting that, uh, you've got to have legislation behind it. You can't just leave it to the industry to fix themselves um, because the poor people will get left behind. I agree. 
and it, it's it's in that side of the that side of the world it's a very interesting place to be but what it is driving is some fantastic new tech which i'm sure you're all aware of uh that's that's really you know you can with some of these companies i've mentioned one you can actually follow the criminal through as they go from east to west across your system paul's going to talk about this because it's something we do a lot with our channel and we do a lot with customers to, to walk them through our understanding of how it works. And then we map what we do into it. And we are a part of the jigsaw. We're not the whole jigsaw. Okay. Any more questions before I move on? Um, uh, yes. We have a question from Andre Bania at Kit Guru. He is asking, does this technology have any application into the world of EVs and autonomous driving? where an attack could easily be fatal. Which technology are we referring to? Oxerve. <laughs> the, the latest one, because his question was the last one. So what, what we were just talking about uh, just now, uh, uh, under, unless Andre, you'd like to qualify that if I didn't do that properly. Uh, to answer the question, I don't know the answer to that. I think, um, it's too early to say uh, at the moment these some of these technologies require quite a lot of infrastructure and to scale it down to something which could fit into that environment um, is uh, I think that's that's a way off. I mean, most of these technologies are using very complicated artificial intelligence using deep learning type type processes, and they do require an awful lot of compute and data to work as, as you will all know, uh, and they'll require an active connection back to um, I'll call it the mothership to to actually, you know, facilitate those those proactive um, activities. Okay. Uh, yes, Andre just uh, apologised. Said sorry, my microphone is not working. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. That. Shall I move Back on? Back to you, Mick. Okay. So moving on. So look, um, every vendor puts one of these slides up. You can read the numbers. Um, you can agree or disagree, larger or smaller. The point here is um, the data protection market is growing. You know, I you know I, I look at EMEA and say EMEA is currently around a three billion addressable market, uh, of which of which we can address a, a, a fair chunk of that. Um, but the, the trend is uh, it's all uh, it's moving very quickly to uh, subscription based. Uh, and cloud-based. And we've seen a huge uptake in service-based uh, requirements, whether it's backup as a service um, or whether it's data um, disaster recovery as a service. I mean, disaster recovery as a service is almost becoming a feature now of every single bid that we work in in the field. Okay. Archiving is fairly, um, fairly stagnant, really, um, because a lot of people, I believe, are using other tools to achieve a similar um, a similar outcome. So, but you know, that market, if you look at that market size, um, is still tiny when you compare it to the likes of the cybersecurity market. And I mentioned we've seen a, a convergence of data protection vendors. There's some of my friends and colleagues in the industry on this slide. Um, you know, it's a very small industry, it's a storage and, and data protection. We all, we all have friends and family in them. Um, and a lot of vendors are doing different things to try and tap into that larger cybersecurity market. Um, and, you know, we believe uh, there's only two people today that have actually got a level of integration for the right, the right technology. Um, uh, and, and we believe that Oxo are the only ones that are doing it with the best of breed as opposed to building it yourself. So we're going to see more and more of these companies moving towards each other. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you may have seen some press, you may have seen some activities in the market around Sophos, and Nutanix, uh, Nutanix, uh, Sophos, and Oxer have a very strong alliance together. Uh, you'll see some videos, you'll see some announcements um, uh, as we as we build converged solutions to try and address not only the infrastructure and protection but also the security side of that as well. So, and as I mentioned, it's a much bigger market. It's seven x uh, the the data protection as, and. Uh, storage software market um, and what we're seeing now in a lot of our a lot of our deals in fact most of our business ransomware cyber security is a mandatory requirement uh, and the chief security officers and that security team are not only just becoming a part of the decision process um, but they're also using that budget 
for data protection projects. And this is an interesting dynamic from a company in my space for how you actually address the market and address the customer needs. So, you know, things that we're seeing in EMEA, now I'd like to stress that this is an EMEA view, um, not necessarily for the rest of our regions. I mean, you know, we're, we're global and some of our regions like Japan have a, have a, a totally different model and a different view. Um, I've talked about the cloud. Um, there is a reduction in the market. It can be anywhere between 10 and 30%, depending on which country we're looking at across EMEA. Um, we have seen a huge swing in hyper-converged. We've seen a lot of our business, and Paul's got some details on this, moving towards partnering in and meeting the market with those vendors like Nutanix, um, where they're buying a Nutanix uh, HCI for production. Um, they're using maybe a VMware farm or still Hyper-V um, for, uh, for test and dev or, or secondary. Um, and they're using our technology to protect it all and provide business continuity. And, and the demo is going to show you how we do that. Um, but, you know, this pandemic's also made a, a massive move to the cloud. It's made a massive move to exposing data fragility in a, in a home working environment, um, uh, not only from a connectivity, but from a protective point of, of view as well. So Paul's going to mention as well about, you know, ransomware. We, we, we use the word ransomware too loosely you know it's not just about somebody saying i've got your data give me some money it's what else they do so exfiltration where they copy it and threaten to publish it that's becoming more more relevant um and in fact it's, it's a lot more dominant from a uh, from the customer's perspective there's a couple of things that have changed dramatically uh they have less people they have less money um uh they have less time and you don't need me to tell you that. I'm sure you're seeing that from every single vendor and, and every um, publish, publication um, from the different sectors. Um, the challenge is they don't have uh, less requirements. They have more compelling data to manage. They have more security threats with cybersecurity. Um, and quite often they have more complexity because a lot of customers today still have multiple vendors that have organically grown over the years. Um, combine that with remote working, we're seeing customers now looking for reliability versus, uh, you know, versus new shiny toys, um, and security is the biggest threat. So one of the one of the reasons, if you look at ArcServe, why do people buy from ArcServe? And I'm going to come on to a slide on that in, um, in a moment. Predominantly, it's around the fact that you can do a lot more with a lot less. Um, I'm not just saying that as a fluffy statement from a vendor. It, it is we allow quite high levels of consolidation, and we co allow quite a lot of simplification at a much lower cost. So IT generalists, instead of uh, detailed specialists, can manage the environment. And we're seeing a lot of customers um, looking for ways to buy technology today, but pay tomorrow, okay? Um, that's, that's understandable as their budgets have moved, moved out. So the sort of things that we're doing uh, with in the market and with our um, channel partners as well is there's three core buckets that I've been driving around EMEA. This is from a commercial, how do we help these customers that have a big problem, but constraints of budget and people and time? Because um, this is a short, short, hopefully it's short term with the pandemic, hopefully within you know nine to 12 months, we'll be, we'll be coming out of this at a pace. Um, but this, you know, to, to manage this transition to a subscription model versus spending hard cash, we're, we're offering 0% finance, we're offering uh, buy now, pay later at our expense. We're not asking customers to charge for that. Um, we've got the universal license, which has been announced. I told you about that earlier uh, on subscription um, and that's capacity based. So we don't care how many servers, how many workloads, if you need a terabyte, you buy a terabyte and then you just buy it for as long as you want. Um, and we've got a subscription for both a direct cloud or a hybrid cloud option. And with regards to cash flow management, we've got the UDP Community Edition come out. I'll talk about it in a second. We're, we're doing things like um, you need our best practice is three, two, one. So you need at least two copies. Um, so two appliances. So we're saying if you buy one, we'll, we'll give you the other one. Um, and we're also encouraging the cloud. Um, if you've got a hybrid, if you need hybrid cloud, but you don't have the money to pay for the software, we're going to sort of manage. Um, that for you as well, so that you can you can take the cloud today, fix your business, but not have to worry about buying the software 
with that cloud. So we're doing a few things like that, uh, as well as offering health checks, uh, and as well as integrating at, at no cost to the customer, Sophos Intercept Techs across all three platforms that we have. And this is enabling customers to move forward. Um, many, many uh, um, deals that we've done recently have taken one or more of these offers to help customers do their business today instead of trying to delay it for six months. And it's enabling our partners to have a refreshing conversation with their clients. Okay, so five motions that I'm seeing, ransomware I've talked about, we are gonna keep going on about it because it's, it's, it's the number one thing we get asked. It's now mandatory in pretty much every public sector tender um, that, that you've got to have a satisfactory answer for, for, for ransomware. Um, and assured recovery, which we're gonna show you is by far one of, the, one of the best technologies, I believe, to allow customers to not only you know, pr protect with Sophos and, and our technology, but, but in the event of, a, of a, an attack that gets through that, they can also recover and provide DR level services for that. Uh, converged infrastructure, talked about that. That's the second largest, these are in priority order, the second largest requirement we get, consolidation. Take my 15 sites of, of different technologies or same technology and converge it into one. They like that because an appliance approach is not only simple from a deployment, but it's simple from a license. There are no other licenses. You, you, you're licensed to use as many copies of the software out wherever until the box is filled up. So again, it's simplicity from procurement as well. And that goes to more- Okay, Mick, yes. sorry. Um, I'd like to quickly jump in. Um, we have quite a few analysts here, both based in Europe. Um, I can see that Josh has oh. joined us from Germany. Josh wasn't here yesterday, so it's great to see you, Josh. Um, and we've got people in the US. We've been talking a lot about trends. Any surprises here? Do you agree with what you've seen? I mean, Tony, Brian, Randy, Camberley, so far, anything you've seen that makes you think, I, I don't think so, I don't quite agree. Or is Mick going down the right path? Nothing that Mick said so far. And why is it Tony's always the first one to say anything? No idea. Um, but yeah, no, nothing Mick said so far has been particularly surprising. Um, the integration with security, it's not the first time that it's been tried in this area, as Mick knows very well. Um, mm. But it makes an awful lot of sense. Um, so uh, it, let me change that. It makes an awful lot of sense from a technology point of view. The question is now whether it makes more sense to businesses and in particular, whether it makes more sense to financial markets who didn't quite understand the interlinkage between the two in the past. So that there's a huge number of elements in here. But in terms of the architecture of the solutions and the structure of the story that Mick's been telling, um, there's been nothing that um, I've been surprised by or objected to. Because, as you know, if I had objected to anything, I would have said so before now. I'd, I'd, um, I'd agree with that as well. Yeah. A, I don't think there's anything too surprising. The unification makes total sense. Consolidation. Consolidation is an interesting one because um, with the pandemic response, it'll be interesting, as in may you live in interesting times, to, to see how that works from the consolidation point of view, because with more and more people working um, remotely part of the time, uh, be be interesting to see how that affects the footprint of where the security needs to be. You know, we we, we talk uh, and hear a lot about um, remote type working, hybrid working, increasing the attack surface, for instance. So um, I'm assuming that will be discussed. At, that we will discuss that at some point. Thank you, Brian. We yeah. I guess just one question unless my attention slip um, a lot of this stuff about ransomware and so on is social not technology so the company needs to have thought about what its response to ransomware will be whether it's prepared to pay um, criminals um, all that stuff it shouldn't be a discussion that's happening just as it happens it should be something this discussion that happens well in advance so that when you do get hit by ransomware you've had all the difficult discussions about the um, company culture and stuff like that is that making sense 
I, I can't agree more. Um, There's a lot when, to be said for making paying making pay ransom payments illegal, isn't there? Mm. Well, there is, except that if that puts you out of business, that's a, you know it is easy to make them illegal, um, uh, and then sort of you end up riding, uh, sorry, um, compromising in, in reality, pretending that you didn't make the payment, stuff like that. Um, um, I think technically, I believe the UK has is. always had a law that said paying ransom is illegal. So, but it's very hard to police, of course. Yeah, and you, you change it. You don't, you don't make you don't make a ransomware payment. You do something else, um, which in effect is a ransomware payment, but not officially one. I think that you need to have a discussion of the moral issues at quite a great depth before you start putting um, um, knee-jerk reaction laws in place. Yeah, in fact, the, the culture the issue is, goes way beyond just that whole area it's much more about how well educated is the company how much does the company know um, how well does it help its users understand what's going on what the threats are so it goes way beyond simply you know not paying and paying yeah, yeah. Uh, that's more to do with it's, it's oh, risk management you know it's risk management this is this is something that they uh, that every organization should be figuring into its uh, risk assessment risk strategy is you know what's going to happen if, if this happens and um, what's going to happen if we do this in response it's it's an interesting right. subject, yeah. Um, and yeah. we are definitely seeing a lot of customers assigning budgets for this, um, putting money aside for it. Uh, even even politics, um, you could imagine that if a particular <coughs> regime posts a lot of ransomware, um, perhaps there should be um, um, trade. Um, embargoes against that company that against that country um lots of options none, none of them obvious but i think you need to have police action at the highest level um making hosting ransomware organizations um, less profitable or less attractive okay talking okay. about ransom there are two two types there are small criminals which you can act against them legally and etc. But don't forget that the big ransom and the big uh, security assaults are from governments, like yeah, the North, you, North Korean government. Yeah. And you cannot put le any le le any law against them. No, but you can you can include that in your sanctions against the country, that um, you know countries do try to influence other countries and i think that hosting provable ransomware organizations ought to be treated as almost an act of war yeah. okay. sure well i'm not sure i'm not sure we, we can go down that path <laughs> at, at the moment no. <laughs> not in the time we have allocated no. despite it's a very interesting conversation we've got a couple more questions coming in uh, mick this one is from bertrand garret from uh, l'informaticien in france mm -hmm. uh, bertrand is asking what will change with the integration of storage craft in this offer do you do you mind and oh, no, i'll answer it now um do you mean with regards to ransomware? Oh, for Christ. For example, yes. Bertrand? Yes, for example. But uh, what, what, what will change in the, in the, with, uh, with uh, of course, cybersecurity, but also uh, in the cloud and hybrid cloud solutions okay. with integration of storage craft? So a lot, a lot of opportunity with the proposed merger. I must say proposed merger because it hasn't yet been um, ratified. Uh, we've just signed a DA, a designated agreement for the intent. Um, but as I don't know if you, any of you were briefed by Tom and Doug, um, uh, the two respective CEOs, but there's a, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity. As you know, there's gonna be more consolidation in this marketplace. There's a lot of players. Uh, or with their own sort of messages and, and, and approach. Um, what I see with this is, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, we were um, we moved into mid markets and, and higher lower enterprise uh, storage craft are very strong in the SMB. 
uh, uh, particularly in the MSP market. And that's not where we're strong at all. Um, uh, you know, and they're not strong in the mid markets um, or, or in, you know, that type of higher scale business. So there's a, there's a, you know, I call this sort of, we've just got engaged and we're going to get married soon because there's, there's a lot of opportunity now to span the portfolio and solution across the whole market. Um, so, you know, and they're very strong, as you know, in the subscription cloud business and cloud services for DRAS, for Microsoft 365 and, and back up to the cloud. Um, they have some interesting technology uh, around scale out, object based scale out um, with their Exablox acquisition from a few years ago. Um, and the jury's out as to where that fits in the market. Some vendors will say it's the only thing you need. Uh, scale out uh, secondary storage with, uh, with uh, you know, um, immutability. Um, I think there's a place for it, um, but it's not the only answer. Uh, so, you know, for me, it's, you know, there's not a lot of crossover in technology. Uh, we do have similar software, but at different scales. Um, and a lot of complementary technology, complementary teams, and there's not a lot of crossover in the channel neither. So we've got um, you know, a much broader uh, coverage of the channel across EMEA. I'm talking about EMEA now as opposed to just global. So for me, I did have a slide on this, but I'm, I'm extremely excited. Um, you saw from the, you know, the acquisitions we did before, um, smaller companies with a single, port, a single product. This is a, a merger of two companies with a more diverse set of products that absolutely complement each other. So, you know, I think it's, um, it's a great thing for the marketplace. And it's a great thing for us as the two companies. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Okay. So I'll just go through these very quickly. So I wanna move, I wanna make sure Paul gets a chance to give you some technical stuff as well as my market view. Um, Cloud I've talked about, Microsoft 365. Um, I don't know if you know, there's a report, um, I'll, I'll get the name of it in a moment, but there's a, a report being done and I will, I will get the name of it for you. Uh, the Siren report, C-Y-R-E-N. I don't know if you've heard of these, these this company. Um, in 2019, looking at email benchmark survey. And they've, they've said um, and proven that, you know, back in 2019, 40% of all Office 365 accounts were taken over by cyber criminals, 40%. And that is by far the easiest and most common way of accessing somebody, a customer's environment. And that's, you know, the market's three times bigger than that now. So yeah, Microsoft 365 from a protection point of view from endpoint and from a protection point of view from data, data protection uh, is very much in vogue uh, and most customers are now moving at pace. Uh, and you'll see a lot of vendors doing, doing uh, a lot of marketing around that because it's a, it's a very fast growing market. And the last one, which you might be surprised because this used to be number one, is economics. Um, the economics around consolidation uh, that you get back and simplification um, uh, are, are a priority today, but they're becoming less so uh, than the other, the other issues I've discussed. So I'm not gonna go through all of these. I've got some use cases. I will give you the slides. Uh, please take some time to, to look at them. But what I've tried to do is, is show you a few customer examples that we have that emphasize the points I've made here, that emphasize what's driving, um, you know, uh, opportunities for OXA and requirements for customers. And pretty much every one of these has got customer statements. So this isn't Mick Bradley from OXA saying, hey, it's all great. This is the customer saying it, not me. Um, so I'll just go through these quickly. Um, this is one I will to spend a minute on um, because one of our great strengths, and I, you know, don't please don't ask me a lot of deep questions on dedupe technology. Um, I used to know that a long time ago but we do have some strong data reduction technologies compared to some of the bigger players on the market. This example, and you can see the quote from the customer, um, the, alternative, the alternative vendor being considered was gonna be almost five times more storage requirement. We see an average of three to five times against this particular vendor. Um, and it just makes the compelling commercial case very strong. So this is an example of where economics is just a no-brainer. Hey, I, I, I've got to buy 400 terabytes versus 80 terabytes. Let me think about that for about five seconds, okay? 
a strong case for us. We see a lot of this in the marketplace. Um, cloud, again, cloud hybrid customers that we've had that have a lot of on-prem, they've maybe got some tape, some tape out, um, they've got some physical, they've got some virtual, and now they want to start moving to cloud. Cloud hybrid is an example of where cloud hybrid is working with, with Alpha Sigma in, in Italy. Um, again, I, I won't go through them all, but I do want to talk about this one briefly. So Pick and Null, uh, Belgium company manufacturer, they make weaving machines. Um, quite an impressive setup. You may have seen the news, the cyber attack. If you Google it, you'll find them. Um, you know, they were knocked out quite significantly. Um, they recovered and you can see the statement. I won't read it to you. You can see the statement from the customer. This is one of many. I can tell you now with, with a high level of certainty um, that we've never not been able to recover a customer's data from a, an attack from a cyber criminal against the backup architecture. Okay. So again, this was encrypted, ransomware asked for, the customer recovered from the secondary copy that we have. So it's a great example. Um, so staying on the ransomware theme, you'll have all seen things like this. Um, I'm not, I won't bore you with all the details because I'm, I'm conscious of time, but the way that they attack, and some of you have, have, have hit on this, the way that they attack um, is changing and the amount of money is changing. I mean, you know, it's gone up from 84,000, you know, in what, four quarters to 230,000 as an average payout. And some of them are millions. Well, just think how much infrastructure you could buy from ArcServe for that, or any other vendor, if you didn't like what you're hearing from ArcServe. You can buy a lot of solutions to protect against it. What we're seeing is they're getting so sophisticated. They've got a call center. You can call up and ask for help, right? They're doing it as a service. You know, anybody on this call could log on into the, if you know how to do it, I don't personally, enter the dark web and buy this stuff and do it yourself. So it is a massive implication. Um, and that what I'm seeing, and this is what the customers and partners are telling me, because I'm very privileged I get to talk to some quite senior people in the marketplace, is this just too much confusion? I, I, I can be pretty confident that people on this call will all have a different view of what this is. And some of those statements on there are from ourselves, some are from vendors like Rubric, Cohesity, Veeam. Everybody's got their own message. And the problem is, you know, you have to have a multi-tiered approach to do it. Not one of these. Having, having some sort of detection in your software against uh, uh, abnormal data patterns, that's not going to solve your problem, okay? It'll tell you about it. Well, thank you very much. You've told me I've got a problem. Now what do I do? So you've got to have a, a tiered approach, and Paul's going to come on to this. We believe we're the only ones that can offer this today. That doesn't mean we'll be the only ones that can offer it in the future. So... Again, I'm going to include ourselves in this. This is not just about me bashing the vendors. You'll see a statement there from Arcserve. We've all been guilty in this industry of, of misleading um, the clients, I think, I do believe, um, of, of saying that we have the best solution, we have the only solution. And what we've done at Arcserve, we've done a lot of work with our partner software to take a step back and say, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to provide an absolutely rock solid guaranteed um, service to recover a customer's data because one day a criminal is going to get in that's they always do and so you know we believe that no one's putting skin in the game okay and we're going to fix that and so i want to share with you now no one else has seen this um from our ceo we are launching um and you're the first people to see this we're launch launching a guarantee we are so confident and because we've done it so many times that if a customer gets hit by a ransomware attack on their data. If a customer has ArcServe implemented with our best practices, so Sophos is enabled, Sophos is up to date and running, they've implemented our 321 policy, we will guarantee to recover their data. And if we don't, we'll sign up in blood before they purchase it, that we will give them the money back if we don't. Now you might say, well, that's nice, Mick, but if they, if they, <laughs> If they can't get it back, they're still they're still in uh, trouble. We don't believe that will happen, and we don't believe any other vendor has got um, the, you know the the um, commitment uh, to offer this level of service and guarantee. So this will be coming out soon. We're working on the details. We have all the terms and conditions. Um, I just wanted to share it with this audience first. Okay, uh, Mick. When, when is this um, guarantee launching? Is it currently under embargo or can 
Can no, people write about it now? Go write about it now. There's a, there's a statement there from Tom. Um, feel free. I'm telling every customer today, uh, you know, we've just got to get a little bit, you, you forgive us, but our marketing teams have been a little bit busy the last few weeks <laughs> pulling together um, <laughs> the stuff for the merger. So um, yeah. Yeah, we're a few days Fair enough. Um, we have a question from Ulrika Ries at Tech Target in Germany. Is there yeah. a limit on the amount of money paid back? The limit on the amount of money paid back is the monies we received for the solution. So if, the cust if, if, if we sold a solution which is two 9,000s, some cloud, et cetera, and it costs, I don't know, £100,000 or $100,000, we will pay them back the full cost. Do they still keep the kit? They keep the kit and they keep the maintenance. But forgive me if you don't mind, we are limiting it to one claim per customer. Okay. <laughs> Will you also be helping them diagnose what went wrong should that unfortunate event happen? Because that would seem to be the obvious step to include in this guarantee. We do. And part of the guarantee, Tony, is that obviously before we pay any monies out, we want access to the environment one to make sure that it was compliant mm -hmm. with the terms. Uh, uh, so, for example, if they hadn't updated Sophos uh, for a year, um, we can, I think we'd be within our right to question uh, if they got a, an attack that Sophos, the latest patch, would have found. Um, but we'll also then um, look at how, with them, try and figure out with our consultants um, what what happened, how did the criminal get to all three copies of the data when, when one of them is an air gap copy, um, you know, things like that, and just to make sure that we, one, make sure the terms are correct, and two, make sure we can prevent it from happening. Are you planning on putting in anything that continually monitors the solution to make sure that you know all of the software is kept up to date, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Just again to be a bit more proactive rather than simply relying on the guarantee. So what we're going to do is we won't put any software monitoring on it. That can be quite intrusive for customers. Um, I don't typically like that. Um, what we will be doing is looking for a, a quarterly mini health check. We do a mini health check service today, uh, remote. Um, it's a lot of it is automated and scripted where we can just do a quick look at their environment. Um, I, I suspect that in your smaller customers uh, and in the mid-sized customers, even the idea of a managed service provider doing a regular health check on the platform would not be remiss. Um, I was talking to a company in another space that has um, a first time fix guarantee and they do continual monitoring of their users platforms one to obviously make sure they can fix things when anything breaks and that's a hardware level stuff um, yeah. but also potentially to move it into a much more proactive service so i i think you might be so some of your customers will be sensitive yes absolutely but i suspect there's quite a few others given that lack of skills and everything else that we talked about earlier that might be uh, quite happy to have someone else keeping an eye on them to say oh look you know, that's gone wrong. So if you want to keep your guarantee in place, never mind actually protect yourself, well, um, you know, it's time to do some updates. I agree. I agree, Tony. And like any other offering, um, new offering, there's always a, an opportunity for managed service providers and cloud providers. A lot of our guys, uh, our partners do that today. Um, and if we do get time for Amanda's demo, she'll show you how they do a lot of it. But we've, we not only use mini health checks for the health of our customers, but they're also a great way for us to, to um, you know, help them make sure they have the right tech uh, of the right spec. So um, it's very good, it's not intrusive. Our pre-sales can do it, our partner pre-sales can do it, and the customer gets a good health report that, that goes alongside the automated um, assured recovery reports that UDP delivers as well. Okay, so just, hopefully, just a... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's Ulrika again. Um... So do, as you had successful uh, recoveries from ransomware, do you have an average kind of RPO or amount of data that the customer might have lost? Or is, is uh, I know it's, it depends on, on the individual configuration, obviously, but uh, is there also some advice that you give in that regards to your so, customers? So I don't have averages because most customers won't let us talk about it. Pick and all did because it's public. Um, it's typically the complete data set, the complete data store. Once a criminal's in, um, they can access the system. Um, our system or anybody else's, once they get in there, they can they can encrypt the data store, uh, which can vary from, you know, a few terabytes on a small customer to hundreds of terabytes on a large customer. 
um, but typically they can't get to the additional data stores uh, because of the additional uh, security steps that we take. Um, for, from a recovery point of view, um, I really hope we get to Amanda's demo because you'll see how quick they can recover. It can be minutes. Uh, in Picanel's situation, it was days, but that's more to do with uh, human process, uh, checks and balances on their uh, side. And, and a lot of customers after a ransomware attack tell us they actually have a, it's created an opportunity to improve their processes for how they go about things. Uh, they get very, very cautious after an attack uh, because um, as Paul will tell you, this, these, these criminals, once they're in your system, they've been everywhere. They've been all around and navigated and traversed your system and they're leaving little hooks and little back doors in all sorts of places. So a lot of it isn't about the time to recover, which can be minutes uh, or hours. It's about, well, now I've recovered it, when dare I switch it on? And that's uh, a, a large part of the process as well, which is why, again, it's another reason why partnering with people that know that um, better than us uh, Sophos uh, is that we believe the right way to go. Okay. Thank you. So very quickly, and, I'm, and, I, and I will then be quiet and let the technical people talk and know what they're talking about. You know, fast start to 2021, uh, UDPA under embargo, Paul's going to talk about that. Very excited about that release, not least of which is because it takes our Nutanix and Oracle relationships to the next level and the community edition, which I've, which I've already mentioned. Okay. So uh, I was, I did have a holding slide here. Um, if anybody wants any more questions about uh, the merger um, or the intended merger, um, happily take those questions now. Um, at least to say, I'm so excited about this. This is me, I'm a, I'm a guy from the middle of England and this is me excited. It's, um, it's, it's just pretty good stuff. Uh, and the whole company, both companies are sort of you know, we're like a couple of horses waiting to, 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 to drive out the stables in four to six weeks' times. Perhaps given that uh, time is short, if you want to do ask questions about the merger, you could all do that when you go to the breakout room. Hmm. Would that be okay? And then we can move on to, to Paul and hopefully Amanda as well. Yes, we just have one more question that I'd like to ask Mick before we hand over to Paul. Uh, Mick, we're talking money again. Mm. The money back, this is from David Norfolk at Bloor. The sure. money back guarantee is good as a statement of shared risk. A mm. purchase cost is a tiny part of the potential loss, including reputation loss. Mm. Thoughts, Mick? Yeah, we've thought about that. Um, but you know, we can only, we are a data protection vendor and we can only do so much. I mean, all we, you know, we will guarantee, and it's all over our website, it's everywhere, we will guarantee to recover your data if you get hit uh, and it's encrypted. Because as Paul's gonna tell you, a lot of a lot of cyber attacks, they don't encrypt now, they, they ex exfiltrate and then they threaten to sell it on the web. And, and nobody can, no, no data protection vendor can protect you against that uh, once that's happened. So. You know, we have to limit uh, our skin in the game and our skin in the game is to what we provide the customer. Okay, so it, we have thought about that carefully and we, we did consider taking out some insurances to give them a much higher level of indemnity for that. But we, we, we chose to, you know, we'll only sell you something we, we can guarantee will recover your data if it's encrypted or, or, or locked out. Um, but we can't go beyond that at this time, I'm afraid. Thank you, mate. Okay. Do you want to do the second poll now? Yes, we are. Sure. You should all see the poll on your screens now. So according to a report from November 2020, what percentage of malware attacks you ra use ransomware to encrypt customers' data? 15%, 27%, 50%, 82%, and that magic don't know that many of you asked us to include in previous editions of Technology Live when we had failed to do so. But please don't use that. We'd much rather you actually committed to a figure. You have probably find a report that has all of those numbers in and a lot more. So you should have put all of the above. <laughs> 
No, no. My fellow Chelsea fan. 60% of you have voted. If you could keep voting, we'll just leave it a little bit longer. Come on. Okay, it doesn't look like anyone. This is a sample of the new A-level exams in the UK, isn't it? <laughs> ich bin Deutsch. <laughs> ah. We're at 70. And also beyond the level age. Mm. I'm going to end the right. poll. Conscious of time. You should see the answers now. Tony, that was by choice, so. <laughs> yeah. Mick, Lisa, can you publish the, can you publish the results, please? Thank you. So the answer did, 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 was 27%. And it's a, and the reason we asked that one isn't and, and Tony's right, you know, uh, there's different reports by different people. Um, but the point is, uh, is that there's been a huge shift in what the hackers are now doing and taking your data away and threatening to publish it is having a much higher level of pay, payouts than just encrypting it. So, you know, the, it's actually 50% now of all of these attacks are for exfiltration and the rest is around uh, crypto money. And we didn't put the name of the report on there to protect the innocent, but it is, it is, a, it is a, fellow, a fellow analyst company that did that. Okay. So but can I suggest, Paul, that you, because I think, I think ransomware, I think our intent to around ransomware is well understood in this, this audience maybe we should just skip through some of the ransomware stuff paul and go on to the udpa yeah um, and then get on to a demo yeah is that fair with everybody or do you want more ransomware stuff <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's absolutely fine thank you mick um i just need to share my screen ah there we go so just bear with me while i share my screen everybody uh here we go right perfect so uh Paul Brunier, I've not got much time, so I'm going to whiz through this. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about our portfolio, but I'm going to focus on the X series and the UDP8 release. Um, we can part the ransomware protection if you've got time in the breakout session Paul, afterwards. Paul, sorry. Hello? Paul, this is Fred. This is Fred. Could you slow down your pace a little bit, please? I know you're of excited course. and you have a ton of stuff to go through. <laughs> can I of ask course. you to speak a bit slower? Because quite a few people are taking notes. Fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Fred. You have heard from Mick, we're in the data protection industry. We have a number of solutions because we've been around for so long. And these cover a wide range from archiving all the way up to, well, high availability, continuous data protection. And we bring these out to address the market needs of our customers. And it could be simple file-based backup. It could be disk backup, disk imaging, disaster recovery involving cloud continuous replication with advanced failover support and archiving. And what we do is we actually fill these with uh, a number of solutions, uh, some we've developed over the years and some we've acquired through acquisition that Mick alluded to. We have a number of cloud options. The ArcServe appliance business has grown significantly in recent years. Um, the turnkey appliance, it offers immediate simplification and ease of operation. Mick covered those. Um, ArcServe continuous availability is our continuous replication product for that high availability. We've got migration capabilities and services that underpin all of these as well. The point about this chart is just to give you an idea of the breadth of different solutions that we have within our portfolio. And it's to address different customer needs, RPOs, RTOs, different value points as well. Now, the X series, um, it was released at the end of 2020 and is our latest generation appliance. It's our fourth generation appliance and it represents an evolution from where we came from originally six years ago. We've taken scalability and options to a new level, pushing boundaries and so on. And now we're into the multi petabyte arena with this. So we're scaling with this as the market scales and as demand scales. We call in this appliance the X series. There's uh, five models in the range, and each model is denoted, you can see in the table, bottom left, with a label and with both the effective capacity that we believe it can protect and the actual 
usable capacity. The reason those figures are different is that we have inbuilt advanced data reduction. So if we take the X1000 model, it has a native and protected capacity, usable capacity, 352 terabytes with a three to one data reduction. And actually we do tend to get more than that. Um, it's, it's capable of storing a petabyte. Um, and a very important thing with this model is that it's one physical chassis and it houses all of the different models. The models simply denote the capacity that we have inside the chassis. So you want to go from one model to the next, all we do is add additional capacity to the same unit. So it's the same physical footprint. We put a minimum of one terabyte of RAM in these units, expandable to two terabytes. We're using um, dual Xeon Gold, 56 core CPU, a lot of processing power, and we're also using NVMe solid state drives in the system as well. There's some of those in the head unit and we're using traditional spit spinning disk in the core data area as well. But for us, this actually allows us to offer a solution for the larger customers and the larger capacity needs. We're already attracting a lot of interest. You can see at the bottom of the screen, there's a number of uh, awards we've already run and we're continuing the theme of including Sophos Intercept X, our endpoint security solution, included and integrated with this X series. Now, just getting down into a little bit of detail with this X series system. We have at the top a compute unit. So it's got the memory, it's got the CPU, and it has 24 disk slots. We use two of these for basically system. We use six of them for our UDP. This is the ArcServe UDP software uh, for some of its core tables, hash tables. And we have spare slots. And those spare slots we can offer to add additional NVMe drives in them. The use cases for these, this is where it gets interesting. This is where we can think about a backup, a DR appliance now can be multi-purpose for different use cases. Things like active disaster recovery, things like VSB, it's virtual standby, it's a feature we have, and Amanda will show you a little bit about this, and things like active antivirus scanning. So these are offered in expansion units of four, um, we call them quads, but a pack of four NVMe drives at once, customers can choose uh, with four, eight, 12 or 16. They can put in four and then add them as need be. But we can actually use that and the processing power in this unit to actually offer more value, more capabilities to customers. We also chose to bring that down into the existing 9000 series range that was launched almost two years ago now as well. So we can also add NVMe drives into the 9000 range, again, supporting multiple use cases for, for, for customers' operations. So now it's not just this simplified, consolidated, converged backup appliance. It can actually be multipurpose and offer a lot more value than that as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about ArcServe UDP, Unified Data Protection 8.0. I need to point out we are under embargo, please, until March 2nd, 9 a.m. EST. The headline features of this uh, product, and Mick has actually alluded to some of these already. Previously, we only included the Sophos Intercept X endpoint software around our appliances, but now we're making it available for software-only deployments. It uh, has to be with our universal licensing, but this way we're actually offering or making um, it available to customers for software-only deployments where the customer provides their own hardware and or appliances as well. That's quite a big step for us because we're now in including that security wrap for basically all of our core offerings going forwards with UDP. We're supporting immutable cloud storage now with Amazon AWS S3 object lock feature. And that is all down to market demand, customers asking for an off-site, off-host repository that can be locked down. Take a copy into it, lock it down, you know it's secure. We're also including Oracle database support. Now we've got a lot of customers already using Oracle and we're helping back them up. But what we're going forward with is specific RMAN integration support. Uh, again, driven from customer demand. We're also included within this release, Oracle Rack and Oracle ASM support as well. I'll mention those in a moment. 
We've done more work with Nutanix to support specifically their, their files and there's some technology under the covers that they asked us to work with. So we've had our engineering departments working together and also Nutanix objects. Uh, and again, that allows us more, more deeper integration and deeper penetration, if you will, working with Nutanix solutions. We're also bringing out a number of Microsoft 365 enhancements. A lot of these are under the covers, performance enhancements and so on, but they're allowing us to scale to the larger customers. We've got a number of customers now within EMEA with multiple tens of thousands of users mailboxes, for example. We also including Microsoft Teams support uh, in this as well. Now, just some specifics around the Oracle side of things. Uh, I mentioned uh, Arman integration. If you think that, I think the figures are something like 98% of the Fortune 500 companies operate Oracle. Although we've been able to work with them, it's had to have a lot of handholding. But now we can offer this native backup integration with the Arman products. We can now offer that seamless integration that the DBAs uh, are using tools that they're familiar with, they're comfortable with, they're happier with this. And altogether, it actually comes together in what we're calling an orchestrated recovery solution for them. So we're enabling that integration with our Arcs of UDP solution just to make the simplification, the ease of operation com come to the surface and just make it easier for customers to consume this, easier for us to roll out and expand within existing customers' environments as well. On the Nutanix side, we've supported AHV for approximately two years now. We invested in supporting those a while ago. We've got a lot of customers operating Nutanix today. But this takes us again into another area where we're supporting Nutanix objects, Nutanix files. Uh, and this is where we can have this sort of single management of data protection across a wider, a wider breadth of uh, Nutanix use cases, if you will. Um, so this is something that we're really pleased about, that Nutanix and ourselves have come together to work on this, learn from each other, and basically build these solutions um, in, you know, in that complementary way. Now, just Paul, to give... Hello, yeah? Can I... We have a question uh, through the chat. This is from Mary Branscombe. Mary is asking, have you worked with Oracle? Are they comfortable with this? I know they can have views on third-party support. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. When we work with these organizations, we actually engage in it at an engineering level or sort of corporate management level as well. So the short answer, Mary, is yes, we absolutely do. Uh, and think one of the things that we were surprised about from the technical community when this came out was including um, support for things like Oracle Cloud as well. So there's been a lot of that work in the background for us. So, um, yeah, the very short answer for that, Mary, is uh, yes, the two organizations have come together for this uh, operation as well. So there's been a lot of discussions going on in the background with Oracle, and that continues to go forwards as well. I think if I can just add as well, there's uh, quite a lot of excitement in those conversations around the Oracle cloud. As you know, um, Oracle are pushing their cloud quite a lot and they're, they're quite excited about our technology being able to move data using native Oracle tools into their cloud. So um, there'll be more on that in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you, Mick. Okay. Um, and I wanted to actually refer to a, um, a customer use case as well. And you can see with this picture uh, on the left-hand side, this is from a customer in the UK. And uh, the customer gave us permission to use that, although uh, we can't actually let their name out. Um, but you can see at the top, that is with the yellow bezel, is an ArcServe appliance. Um, it's a 9000 series appliance, so it's the uh, third generation. Um, but it, 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 it's the big one. We call it the 9504. It has 168 terabytes of a native usable capacity with a three to one reduction, it equates to being able to store approximately half a petabyte of capacity. Um, this is um, quite a sizable or a reasonably sized Nutanix uh, cluster, 16 node cluster running Nutanix AHV. The customer in this, uh, we included this or I included this, really just to illustrate that we are getting involved more and more with customers um, who are running Nutanix clusters, part of their production environment, bigger clusters than they perhaps were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Um, but it's where the partner have actually brought this together as a meet in the field, meet in the channel solution. So we're finding a lot of, a lot of success, a lot of activity in that space. 
On the one hand, as Mick uh, pointed out previously, the growth in hyperconverged infrastructure as solutions out there, but we're also seeing that customers are investing more in that. And then the whole principle about simplification of operation, which is where Nutanix position a lot of their value, we also have that very similar value with the ArcSo proposition, certainly with the turnkey appliance in this case. So it's two solutions coming together, but added on top of that is the additional solution about the Sophos, because of course we provide Sophos endpoint security around our backup infrastructure, around the ArcSo appliance. So this is now a ransomware protected uh, appliance as well. Just one simple example about where this has come together. Now, this is the 9000 appliance, and this photograph was from last year, so that doesn't include some of the UDP 8 features. But again, for us, this opens up further conversations with this customer, should they be going down Nutanix files and, and or Nutanix objects routes? Because the UDP 8, with the capability that we've developed jointly with Nutanix, takes that off the table. We can offer that support as well. So just um, uh, a bit of a summary slide here. When I talked about the X series, for us, this allows us to scale into larger opportunities uh, and or where consolidation may be appropriate, where otherwise a larger number of smaller uh, appliances may be needed. One physical model in the range, and so it's a lot easier to grow footprints because all we're doing is adding in capacity, but now being able to consider the multiple purposes of that appliance with the addition of further NVMe drives. It gives us a lot of scope to revise a lot of additional services in the customer. Disaster recovery, I mentioned, active AV scanning, for example, being able to instantiate a VM completely separate from the, from the production environment and scan it at that point before it's returned into production to make sure it's absolutely virus free lot of value in doing that and this architecture gives us that capability. UDP8 allows us to support a lot more customer environments and requirements including those with Oracle where the Oracle um, uh, environment and team and the DBAs they're used to using our man they want to continue using our man they don't want to break out of our man fine you know we can have those conversations now. Nutanix objects and files and Nutanix are actually building out all these services you know around these and going forwards and you know, we are hoping to be part of that journey continuing going forwards, which is fantastic news. And then additional support in the Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams area. As Mick said, that was one of the key buying motions. And we're seeing a lot of activity, a lot of interest in the market, basically a lot of growth in the market out there. So for us, it's already creating a lot of interest out there. I get out and talk with customers. I'm very privileged that I can talk with a lot of customers and partners across all of EMEA. And I'm seeing all of these trends myself out in the field as well. We consider, and I know this might be a little bit of an interesting point, but we consider that we are the only data protection vendor with the anti-ransomware really at the heart of our solution. And for us, it's both it's both figurative and, and, and it's you know it's physical. Because ever since we actually partnered with Sophos in 2019 and actually brought this solution to market as an integrated platform. As Mick said earlier on, we've seen a lot of other companies come out and now everybody's got a ransomware message. But the way we look at the market is that really not everyone is doing the same as what we do and how we do it. So um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, very, very quickly. And actually, Sorry, Raki, Paul, I probably Paul, don't have any time doing it. Yes. No, no, before I carry on, I just wanted to get some feedback from our... Um, from our audience here, because um, obviously you just launched a product. So can I go to Anthony? Anthony, wh what do you think of the new, um, what um, do you think of uh, uh, what's just been discussed? Do you see much differentiation? Is it a Me Too product? What do you think? Well, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by a Me Too product, but the thing, the thing is with um, something like a backup product is, that there are there are kind of fundamentals at the roof at the root of it that that do you know that do a particular well if if not a simple job then a fairly you know a job that we can understand as as mm -hmm. protecting data by copying it essentially and and every feature that comes in a backup product is to do with what it will back up where it will back it up where where it will move it to etc cetera, etc cetera. so 
it, it becomes difficult to track a lot of these products, I find, because they, they are, um, you know, vast collections of those type of attributes. So, um, I mean, I think the the the, the sorry the, the anti ransomware thing is a, a good and distinctive type thing that I'm not sure I've seen quite such emphasis on from other people, but there are the caveats that people have talked about in terms of well you know okay so it's good to be have this guarantee for example but there's a heck of a lot more cost and inconvenience around being hit by it, <clears throat> and and then there are just mine small things really uh, Veeam eleven this week has has uh, added Arman protection. I think they've also introduced G Suite protection alongside Microsoft 365. So I, I would wonder if that's something that's all, that's there in uh, ArcServe. But in general, though, I just I just haven't you know my my understanding of ArcServe is you know kind of where is it in the market? It's kind of seems like it's um, you know it would be in the championship if it was a football team perhaps and maybe nudging at the top the the lower edges of the premier league so i'm wondering you know what is it that that gets a gets a player from there to the highest levels also thank you anthony paul oh i think enrico was going to say something sorry enrico yeah, go for I it think and uh, for well, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, you know the obvious, and then and then we spent a very little uh, on the product. My problem is that I don't see anything that you know is a real differentiator. I mean, ransomware protection is you know, table stakes today for every backup vendor. I mean, if it's not from the last year, it's from this year. So that's so e even the. Uh, the vendors that are, you know, notorious is low in presenting new features that they have ransomware protection of some sort now. The, the problem is that also the appliance is nothing new. I mean, everybody has an appliance, even the uh, Veritas now has an appliance, you know, everybody has an appliance. So what are we doing here? For example, where is the SaaS offering? Or where is the... Uh, offering for MSPs, where is, uh, I mean, I miss a lot of things that are now the next step for, uh, you know, data protection. And I'm not talking Famous. about, you know, the list of features, you know, more, more or less, probably you have all, all the features you are serving physical and virtual, and maybe Hyper-V and VMware, and maybe also uh, KVM and all the others, I don't know, but, but you know, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you do all of these things. Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Where is Kubernetes? I mean, uh, I, I would love to see the new stuff. I mean, not that Kubernetes is 100% of the workloads now, maybe it's 1%, maybe less, but mm. you know, uh, you have to be there when uh, the demand uh, start to rise. So, so if I can answer a couple of those things. Um, not first of all, I don't believe everybody has an appliance. I think one of the largest backup vendors in the world doesn't have an appliance being Veeam. They tend to meet in the market with other people. Um, so I think that's an important point worth making um, because a lot of those examples I showed you were against that particular vendor where the cost of infrastructure is, is difficult. Now, that's not taking anything away from them. F fantastic company, you know, great. Um, with regards to... Uh, uh, some of the future stuff, um, uh, particularly around containers, uh, and it's very much on our roadmap. But what we didn't choose to do today is, is do a, a, just a general purpose roadmap. But those things are coming and coming fast. What we believe is, and you're right, you're right to say it, it is hard to see the, the tree from the woods with so many vendors in this space. And, and I think it's fair to say everybody does a good job at backing up data and, and generally protecting a customer's data. Um, I do believe um, our approach to the ransomware thing is, is different to the others, which is why we emphasize it so much and because it's why it's front of mind. Um, we don't believe that creating some of your own code to do anomaly detection and say you have a ransomware solution or enabling object lock and saying you have a ransomware solution is 
as, as I said in my section, we think that's irresponsible um, and not the right way forward. We believe in a, 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 a multi-tiered solution that encompasses from, from the endpoint protection through to uh, the data protection and prevention of the, the, the cyber criminals getting onto the system. And where we see the differentiation for our technologies, and obviously we think we're, we're in the, uh, the top tier football team, not the Champions League, <laughs> but, um, uh, or certainly in the playoffs, let's say. Um, we, we, you know, when customers, uh, I, I did try and make this point, when they're moving to cloud, and which they're doing, and they're using some cloud with some on-prem, uh, or some hybrid cloud, some direct cloud, and some on-prem, um, that coming together under one umbrella, under one software suite, is very much differentiated for us because a lot of the a lot of the other vendors in the marketplace have to cooperate with other vendors to, to meet those solutions. So, for example, if we have a customer that needs zero downtime, they need continuous data protection with automated failover. You know, a lot of the other players in the market can't offer that. They have to go to a Zerto or somebody else to offer that solution. So, it's very. Um, there is no sort of, hey, I have a feature, I have a button that nobody else has. But when you look at the spectrum of services you need to offer, including SaaS, so the software as a service model, uh, the cloud subscription-based model, which is becoming a significant part of our business, um, is there today. Um, and, you know, maybe we haven't done a good enough job of, of, of showing that to you today. Um, but if we do get time for the demo, and I think we should use some of the remaining time to do that, Paul, so let's not do any more on the, the other stuff. Yeah. Okay, You'll sure. see how the technology is used. Uh, and this assured recovery, I believe, is a unique, is a unique feature of our technology. Um, and I'd appreciate your views back on that, if, if you believe that is unique or not. But these are, the these are the features of our technology that are being used by clients to provide services that are being used not only for their own benefit, but also to charge out as, as a, a service um, option within MSPs, uh, CSPs and, and cloud providers. But I do agree, it is, there's a lot of players in the market and, and sometimes it's difficult to, to, to set them apart. Um, right, I'm conscious of time. I just wanted to uh, uh, bring up the fact that Anthony just said, Veeam added CDP yesterday, by the way. And that was a message Anthony meant to send to everyone, but he only sends to me. Mm -hmm. And yeah. David is saying, I think that Arxiv's approach to ransomware looks good. And I like the money back guarantee. Wow. Shared risk. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can, <laughs> but it is ne necessary, not sufficient. Company security culture and attitude to integrity matters too. Does mm -hmm. Arxiv promote the human aspect discussion initiatives too? This is probably something we can discuss in the breakout, guys. Yeah, basically what I wanted to show everybody is um, a little bit about uh, what Mick and, and Paul uh, told us before. So how we, we address the, the ransomware threat uh, with, um, uh, with our software, uh, not just with the, the cybersecurity side of it that we, we have provided by Sophos, but how we actually implement some techniques to, to prevent ransomware from, from causing damage. Um, uh, so one of the, the aspects that we discussed is the three to one approach. And that's the first one that I want to show you. Uh, UDP works with a, 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 a way of configuring uh, the backup tasks that you need to run uh, in a different way from uh, other vendors. So uh, we work with uh, workflows that will allow us to, to do the different things that we need to do. Obviously, we, we back up, we restore. I'm not going to be showing that to you. I'm going to show the, the uh, key differentiators. So the plans, um, the protection plans uh, are the, the feature that we use to actually build that workflow that will deliver what we're talking about. I will show you one example that I have here in my lab environment, which is a physical uh, SQL server. Um, and uh, you can see on the right side here uh, how this is set up. So I have my first task, which is obviously the backup task that take, takes that snapshot from the physical server and brings it into uh, our backup server. 
Then I have a copy of this machine that is pre-restored and that's what we call virtual standby. And it's uh, pre-restored in a virtualized environment on my on-prem environment, right? So on my on-premises environment, it's uh, being stored on my Hyper-V, one of my Hyper-V servers. And if I look at it there in production, uh, you can see this machine here that is off. This is basically that virtual standby uh, ju just standing there. Um, the third task that I have here. Can I, yeah. can, I, can I stop you a second? Um, yes. We have a question from Anthony Adshead. Anthony is asking, is there NAS backup in ArcServe, NDMP or CBT type? Um, I'm sorry, didn't get the question. Yeah. Is there NAS backup oh. in ArcServe, either NDMP or CBT type? If you go in the chat, you will see the question there. Um, if I could just um, interrupt here as well. I've just seen the question. I'll just yes. actually put an answer in chat. So, uh, yeah, the short answer is yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, the third task, task that I have here in my plan is actually to replicate this backup to Microsoft Azure, right? So instead of... Uh, Configuring this task separately and, and uh, minding uh, you know, the schedule and things like that, what we can do is basically put all of that into a protection plan and that works as a workflow, right? Uh, we're gonna have the, the second uh, part of this plan on the cloud console because I'm taking this to Azure and it's an air gap copy. So I have another console there that is completely separate from my um, on-prem environment, uh, which is actually here on my second tab. As you can see here, I'm accessing this from Azure. And here I will have the, I'll have the plan that connects to this one. So basically what this plan does is then repli uh, receive the replication from the on-prem environment, create another virtual standby, which is another copy of that machine in the cloud, and then do the assured recovery test. You've seen me talk about the shared recovery a couple of times in this presentation, and I'll go a little bit deeper into that. But what I want to show you right now is if uh, in a case of a disaster, I need to have this machine up and running in Microsoft Azure, uh, all I would just have to do is come here, right click, standby VM, and then I can select any of these uh, snapshots that I'm storing with this pre-restored machine. Um, I'm going to take the latest one that I generated today and then just power on. Um, this will allow us to have a machine up and running on Azure. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of my, my Azure console. Um, so you can see here I have a bunch of, of virtual machines running there. This is actually my UDP instance on Azure. Uh, and what you're going to see in a couple of minutes is that I'm going to have a fifth machine here, which is basically going to be this SQL server that I have on my on-prem environment being spun up on the cloud. Um, and it's going to be available for use. So it's going to take a couple of minutes while we configure Azure, uh, but you're going to see it running soon. Uh, just wanted to show you the how easy it is to do and how that workflow method uh, can uh, really make uh, our customers' lives easier. Um, going a little bit into uh, Assured Recovery itself, um, I have another plan here that uh, where I do that. Uh, and it's a, a backup from a VMware environment. And then I do the Assured Recovery test on Microsoft Hyper-V, right? One of the, the key things about UDP is, you just find out, I can take a, a physical machine and recover it in the cloud. I can take a, a VMware VM and recover it in Hyper-V. I can take a Nutanix machine and recover it in another hypervisor. So this uh, portability of your, of your systems, uh, this is really, really key. And um, the feedback I got from the customers is that this is uh, something that uh, is, is really important. Um, they're usually uh, very excited when they see something like this. And the thing is, what we're going to do with this assured recovery test is that we're literally going to uh, spin up this machine the, from the backup uh, onto the Hyper-V environment, which is the case here. Uh, we're going to bring that operating system up. Uh, we're going to check if it's working. And if you want, you can actually add some scripts uh, to it. Uh, it would appear here on the advanced tab. But you, you can add some scripts to it to do any other kind of tests that you want. 
this would be done automatically. It's part of a protection plan, so it's scheduled. The customer can configure it beforehand. Uh, and one of those tasks can even be, you know, calling up Sophos and uh, getting Sophos to scan that machine uh, automatically. So that can be scheduled. And I see a, a very uh, interesting advantage there. Now, if um, a customer wants to do that, uh, probably manually or wants to create a sandbox uh, out of their production environment without impacting their production environment to run that kind of task, to, to do a, a, what uh, Paul uh, said previously, an active uh, antivirus testing um, or, or do any, any type of testing that the, the customer would like to do. Uh, we're going to be able to do that using the same technology that is behind the shared recovery, which is what we call uh, instant VM. So instant VM yeah. uh, is that this functionality that allows us to spin up the machines directly from the backup into a new virtual machine. I'll run one for you to see. Um, I'm going to take this machine that is running on Nutanix. Uh, it's coming from Nutanix. Uh, I'm going to create an instant VM. And I will bring it up on Hyper-V. And you might be curious why I'm doing this on, on Hyper-V. I just want to illustrate that. Um, all of this I'm doing in a, in a lab environment is all software based, right? But all of this can be done inside of our appliances and our appliances come with Hyper-V inside of them. They're Windows based, so they come with that Hyper-V inside of them. And you can actually use that environment, that Hyper-V inside of the appliance to create the sandbox and, and refer to these machines from the backup without impacting any of, your, uh, any of the, the production. So. Uh, I'm going to select my Hyper-V here for you to see. Um, I'm going to select one of the hosts. I will need to uh, to specify in the next uh, step a folder uh, which is going to connect uh, a share uh, with the virtual machine on one side and the, the recovery point mounted in the other side on the backup side. Um, let me select this folder here. Uh, I'm going to give some uh, CPU, some uh, memory to this, uh, to this machine. Configure the network. Uh, here it's important to say, uh, I'm gonna use the, the, the same configuration as the source machine. I don't have, a, I'm not gonna have a, a, an IP conflict problem in my lab right now, so I can do that. But if a customer wants to create that sandbox environment and have a separate uh, little environment inside of the, the, the appliance with a different network configuration, they would be able to do that just by selecting a different IP configuration. And that, I mean, they would have no impact into their own network even. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna use the automatic one and I'm gonna click on finish, boot now. And what this will do is uh, take this machine that I backed up from Nutanix AHV without using any agents inside of the virtual machine. Uh, and I'm going to spin it up on uh, my Hyper-V environment, which is, uh, I selected this host, this one here. The machine is just being created now. Uh, in a couple of minutes, you're going to see Windows loading here. Um, and, and when it's done, uh, you know, the customer can do whatever they want with it. This is, uh, this can be used for like an emergency recovery. You lost the machine and you need it running right away somewhere. Um, and then, you know, at night or in the weekend, the customer can go ahead and migrate uh, this, this data to the final destination or recover back to the source. Um, or we can just do it to, to generate this, this sandbox environment and do, uh, you know, the, the ransomware scanning, uh, apply a patch or do any type of testing. A lot of customers cannot afford to have that environment and we're providing that. Uh, within our own appliances, right? So this technology, uh, as you can see here, Windows is starting to load. This technology uh, is uh, what we use for the assured recovery as well. So all of this that I'm doing manually, assured recovery will allow, assured recovery will allow the customers to do uh, automatically, right? So that's part of a protection plan uh, and uh, saves a lot of saves a lot of time. Uh, it, customer can configure it to, to run in the weekends and then just receive a, a report about it after. Um, Amanda, yeah. Amanda, Amanda, just, just when you stop, just, you're going very quickly and we do appreciate that. And there's a lot of things going off here. Um, 
can we just do a check and balance that everybody's understanding what you've done and, and how this would be operationalized by our users, uh, business users? Um, anybody got any questions before we move forward? Yeah. Um, Simon, you've been awfully quiet and you usually aren't um, quiet. So I wanted to make sure. <laughs> no, I wanted to make sure you guys are all um, following the conversation. I know we've got Voice Yitch there who hasn't asked any questions. Hartmut, who's had a few issues coming in and out. I just wanted to make sure that you guys are all following the demo and Bertrand, you as well. Is it clear for everyone? Are you all understanding what's going on? Because I know that yes. one does fly yeah, yes, through it. it. Was, yes, it was clear. You know, it, it, uh, it's like a, it's like a sandbox fart. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah, I didn't see many questions. I was worried if I was doing this in English or Spanish. So I think <laughs> I used the right language. Good. Um, all right. Uh, so basically, um, like I said, uh, uh, this uh, all of this process can be automated with Assured Recovery. Uh, the customer will also have the option to configure what we call SLA profiles. And basically, this will allow the customer to, to put their servers in, in tiers, right? put their systems in tiers. Uh, and we are going to monitor uh, these recovery operations to see if uh, we're meeting those SLAs, right? So the customer would then configure their, their uh, desired uh, RTOs here. Uh, they, they would select the servers that this particular profile would apply to. Um, and uh, that will... Oh, sorry, that will actually feed the dashboard uh, with this chart here that shows basically all the, the these, uh, these recovery operations and their status. And if the customer wants to dig into more detail, uh, they would just click there and, and see what, what happens. So, for example, in the Assured Recovery Task column here, uh, I can see that, for example, this machine that is one of my machines that's, that is doing it, is showing that uh, it matched the SLA it ran uh, in two minutes when the RTO is actually 10 or 20. I don't remember which one I, I put there. But basically, this uh, this is automatically generated. And this can be sent, uh, for example, to the customer's email uh, in a weekly basis, bi-weekly basis, uh, depending on how the customer wants to do it. Um, but yeah. Going back, uh, th this is also something that some of our MSPs use. They, they see a, a lot of value in it. It can be sold as, as a, an additional service to their customers. So there's a, a, an opportunity for, for them as well when our product is, uh, is behind it. Um, I will uh, check the status of the machines that we got running. So let me go back to Azure. I'm going to refresh here. And this machine that you guys see here that is now running, that's MySQL server that came from my on-prem environment, now running in the cloud. Um, I can go into more detail and, and show it running to you here. Um, I, I'm, I'm worried about time, so I'm not going to go on and log into it anyway, but you can see that there's already some activity here in terms of IO and network. So machine is up and running. And um, the other one, I suppose it's, uh, if Windows is not loaded, it must be just about to load. Um, let's connect, just so you can see a little bit of the, uh, of what's going on with that. So yeah, it's probably just, um, I didn't put a lot of resources to it, so it, it might take a, a couple more minutes, but it's already checking the, the new hardware that it's on, and uh, this is going to be running soon. Um, yeah, in a, in a nutshell, this is uh, what I wanted to, to show you. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to, to go through uh, some more stuff or to go deeper into this. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what I wanted to, to share with you. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Amanda. Um, we have got um, another question just come through from um, Jean-Francois Marie. Do you support MVME OF resources? 
NVMe. Uh... Yeah, um, I'll I'll just step in there, Amanda. Yes. So the NVMe ahead. over yeah. fabric, uh, not yet, but that is part of um, what we might be considering for the future. We're not going as mixed as we can't talk about the futures and so on here. But today we're not using the over fabric elements. It's uh, just purely them as, uh, as as drives, I suppose, common drives. That's great. Is there any other questions um, before we wrap this up and run the poll? Um, is there any other questions you've got for anyone from the ArcServe teams? <laughs> We've got some coming through on the chat. Um, is a UDP Amazon machine, machine image available or does it run on Windows Server only? And that's from Christoph Lange. Yeah, we um, it can run as an instance on on AWS uh, if that answers the the question. Um, uh, it's going to be running on Windows, but then you know Windows can be running as an instance on AWS. So we we yeah we we do support and uh, the the same thing that I did with Azure here we can also do with AWS, uh, and we can also expand to to some other. Uh, things uh, like uh, object storage that can be used uh, with immutability um, uh, for uh, as a second uh, backup destination. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, thank you. And do you have a virtual appliance running on VMware with the UDP? You can have. Um, what, uh, I usually tell the customers to, to use that, to, if, you, if they want to have UDP running inside of a VM, to just use it wisely, not putting the same hypervisor as production, uh, just because, first of all, you need to, you should be moving the, the data out of that, uh, of that hypervisor. And second, because you could have resources competing inside of, the, inside of that particular hypervisor as well. Um, so yeah, it, it does work, uh, but we need to see what is the, uh, how the environment is set up, basically. We, we don't have a, we, we don't have a virtual appliance in the marketplace for Amazon and Microsoft, yeah. if, if that yeah. was yeah. where you're yeah. going from, but, but that is oh, yeah. coming, yeah. that is coming, um, okay. in, in our next release. Okay. Thank you. Our next major release. Mm -hmm.